the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. I'm glad to be here with you again this morning and uh, it's great if people come together in order to worship, in order to have communion, in order to feel touched by the blessing of the Lord. Dear friends, it was show and tell in nursery school and the theme was my religion. Three students stood up at the front of the class. The first said, my name is Benjamin, I'm Jewish and this is a star of David. The second student said, my name is Mary, I'm Catholic and this is my rosary. The third student said, my name is Arnie, I'm Lutheran, and this is my casserole. <laughs> of course, children are observant and pick up immediately what is important to their parents by the reverence that is shown. According to Benjamin's view, being Jewish is about identity. Listening to Mary, we get the impression that being Catholic is about prayer. Taking little Arnie at his word, we know that being a Lutheran is about community. Community may be evoked, no doubt, by religious identity and prayer, and, which is important for Lutherans, although Arnie was not yet aware of it, doctrine. In spite of all this, Lutherans are realistically aware that community will be tangible only and radiate warmth if people know about each other's concerns and share food as well as views. In general, if people are interested in what is going on around them and feel responsible. If we are to understand what is going on in our world and about the state of our society, the description from the novel Sunset Park by well-known US American author Paul Auster may serve as well as any. A man, 28 years of age, Miles Heller, is trashing out which is to say he works for Home Preservation Service. On behalf of local banks, he and his colleagues empty abandoned homes and left behind TVs and toys, bottles of whiskey, radios, CD players, archery equipment and trash, of course. Each house, a story of bankruptcy and default of debt and foreclosure. Many houses have been left in a state of destruction. They look as if an eruption of anger triggered a parting rampage of vandalism. Sledged hammered, smashed in walls or walls covered with obscene graffiti or walls parked with bullet holes. Evidence of the rage and despair of the dispossessed. In a world of economic ruin, trashing out is one of the few thriving businesses. While Miles' co-workers grab whatever they please, he is satisfied to take only photographs of abandoned things, documenting the last lingering tra traces of those scattered lives in order to prove that the vanished families were once here. He hardly speaks when he is on the job. His colleague, colleagues have taken to calling him El Mudo, the mute. El Mudo commiserates with the evicted who invis invested in a homestead, were concerned about their children's future, attempted to assure their own carefree old age, participated in community activities and paid taxes. Certainly, most of them lived self-reliant, 
and self and responsible lives. But in spite of working hard and economizing, spending money grew ever tighter. They could not pay their bills out of their paychecks anymore and had to use what had been put by for a rainy day. The rainy day, however, turned out to be many seasons of dwindling incomes. And then the housing bubble burst. The warning of St. James in the epistle reading is to be heard, I believe, from this perspective. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? We pretty much, dear friends, all of us, are enamored with success, are we not? From this premise, we may even feel disdain for the many unsuccessful ones who were not able to make good in this great country of opportunity. But lately, if a person is poor, remains poor, or even reverts to poverty after years of success, depends more than ever on structural changes in the country's economy, in a globalized world with high speculation in money and real estate markets and diminishing job opportunities even for the well-qualified and educated. Not to acknowledge this could very well amount to partiality in favor of the rich and of neglect of the growing numbers of disadvantaged people. Their middle class security has been shattered. Their incomes, if they have any left, are capricious at best. The blows to their self-esteem, which they suffered when they were laid off, their frustrations, even self-recriminations of being unemployed is choking them. We understand St. James properly only if we translate his admonition by asking the question, is it justified that the rich are having the place of honor in our society? Will the poor have to stand over there where they can hardly be seen and don't bother anybody? Miles Heller of Auster, Paul Auster's novel exemplifies to all intents and purposes what the apostle begs us to heed. He feels for the poor. He is concerned about them so much that he even documents the traces of their happier existence. He is miles brighter. His family name Heller can be taken for German to mean brighter. He is miles brighter than most people who think they are living in the best of all possible worlds. And he is far more merciful. Instead of calling the poor lazy or incompetent, he actually, although he is never men it is never mentioned, behaves according to the Eighth Commandment, as explained by Martin Luther. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What does it mean? Answer, we should fear and love God that we may not deceitfully belie, betray, slander, or defame our neighbor, but defend him think and speak well of him and put the best construction on everything. Is it at all surprising that this man goes mute in a society in which success is worshipped? We all know how difficult it can be for an individual to present his view if everybody else around him holds a different opinion. 
even ridiculing him and making him look dumb. It is not easy even for a church to point out the injustices in society and call for peace built on justice, shalom, as it is called throughout the Old Testament. It is bound to be criticized for meddling in political matters on the understanding that, it's speaking, pol that speaking politically is betraying the faith. Being responsible for one's community in the spirit of Christ is, yeah, political, of course. However, it does not betray but confirm the faith. If they are browbeaten or openly criticized, they become mute, individuals as well as churches. Whoever does not speak, though, will soon neither hear nor see. Their senses are close to what is going on around them. They cannot be open to the realities outside their ken. I am happy that Jesus has come to us this morning. In the Gospel reading, he addresses us saying, Ephata, be opened. God, who gave us open senses, does not reconcile himself to closed ones. Therefore, Ephata, God, who already in Old Testament times insisted that wealth was to be distributed fairly, is not satisfied if the goods be bestow he bestowed on man are used egotistically. Therefore, Ephata, God, who perceived how faith in him has become a means of looking down upon others, sent his son to call back his people. Therefore, Ephata. I am glad that Jesus is touching us today, putting his fingers into our ears and loosening our tongues in order that we may hear clearly and speak as plainly as the man did whom he told his Ephata then in the region of Decapolis. Speaking plainly, speaking to be understood, speaking to help in conflicts and quandaries. What we observe these days throughout Christendom is some religious or moral insider lingo which says more about the speakers and the faith they are proud about than about the good news which it should convey. A Catholic priest a Baptist pastor and a Lutheran minister decided to combine their efforts one day to help their community. Each one made a sign and positioned himself alongside the highway. Soon a car came speeding towards them. The priest was first and held up his sign for the driver to read, turn around, you are going the wrong way. The driver gave him barely a glance as he sped by, on by towards the Baptist pastor who raised a sign, the end is near. What is this religious gobbledygook here all about? The driver wondered as he approached the next. The Lutheran minister earnestly holding his sign out silently pleaded, give heed lest you die. You guys are too much, the driver laughed as he passed, waving happily. The scream of tires on pavement was replaced by silence, the silence replaced by the twisting of metal. The three reverend gentlemen thought this over and decided on a new sign. Bridge out. The way, dear friends, these spiritual leaders phrased their warnings was not effective to everyday problems. Jesus talked in order to be understood. He used everyday examples to translate the kingdom of God into the mindset of his day. Martin Luther too attempted to speak to be understood. Pastors should observe how normal people speak, he advised. In the present age, the language of the kingdom is often presented without any concern for people and their circumstances. If they are well off or recently impoverished and don't know how to give their children a decent education 
or single parents holding three badly paid jobs in order to make ends meet or do to develop psychic disorders. The language of the kingdom has been converted into morality and value talk, dealing simply with do and do not. The gospel is thus replaced by sternness. The morality of the times negates what Jesus has lived and died for, and so-called family values drive out love. Once more, in St. James' words, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Just to make this a little more transparent, an Indian Jesuit, Anthony DeMello, in his One Minute Wisdom Stories, points out, the master always warned against the tyranny of the law. Obedience keeps the rules, he would say. Love knows when to break them. This, of course, is in essence what Martin Luther taught us based on justification by faith alone, saying, sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ more boldly still. Paul Auster, through his character Mike Keller, teaches us not to forget the ones who don't count in society and show them respect. Finally, little Arnie, with this casserole, teaches us that love is by no means ineffectual. On the contrary, depending on the situation, it may take the form of a stew brought to potluck or given a single parent who can't make ends meet or be shared with love with somebody who wants us to keep rules instead of following Jesus and his love. If we live up to these advices, St. James will be pleased with us. Amen. And the peace of God who passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.